I upgraded my M1 Pro MacBook Pro to an M3 Pro MacBook Pro. And honestly, I don't think you should do that. But before we get into the do as I say, not as I do. So do. This doesn't make any sense. Let's pinch off this unboxing. So I recently upgraded my M1 Pro MacBook Pro with 512 gigabytes of storage and 16 gigabytes of unified memory to an M3 Pro MacBook Pro with 32 gigabytes of unified memory and 512 gigabytes of storage. I do think I probably would have been okay with the 18 gigabytes of memory, but uh, I do plan on this being my main device for the next five to 10 years. I know I said that uh, when I bought the M1 Pro, but this time I'm being serious, I actually mean it, I think. While I say not to upgrade your M1 Pro to an M3 Pro MacBook, if there is a jump to be had, mine was the largest one that you could do. I started out at the base M1 Pro, and now since I've gone to the 16 inch form factor, you're forced to go with the higher trim of the M3 Pro, meaning I've got a 12 core a CPU and an 18 core GPU. If you get the 14 inch M3 Pro, there's an option for a lower trim of that CPU and GPU configuration. Um, not that I don't think that you would still see some pretty good performance increases, but performance is not a good reason to upgrade from the M1 Pro to the M3 Pro. And that's just from my personal experience so far. We'll get into that a little bit more later in this video. The performance gain that I've experienced is a little bit larger than it would be had you went with the top-end M1 Pro to the top-end M3 Pro. And in all honesty, performance is not the reason why I upgraded my device. So with my jump from the M1 Pro to the M3 Pro, I get four more efficiency cores. Now those efficiency cores are gonna come into play uh, when we talk a little bit more of why I'm upgrading. But let's go on ahead and just hash out the performance just to clarify. The main thing you're gonna notice from M1 Pro to M3 Pro is absolutely gonna be the GPU performance. I think that's what the main focus is this year. They did some demos about playing video games on a Mac. That's kind of a thing. Is it really a mainstream thing? Not yet but I think that's the objective behind making sure these things have pretty strong GPUs. So getting into some of the benchmarks, I honestly am not a huge fan of synthetic benchmarks. I mean, yes, they can kind of tell you some of what you can expect, but in day-to-day -day usage, it doesn't mean anything, right? Especially if you're not using the GPU consistently. But in Cinebench, the scores for the GPUs from the M1 Pro to the M3 Pro, that's where you're gonna notice the biggest impact. With the M1 Pro scoring a 2275 and the M3 Pro scoring a 6361, that's 170% increase in GPU performance. Single core, we've got a 141 versus a 112, which is 26%, not too impressive, but we have more of those cores now. So when you go back to the multi-core score, you'll see the M3 Pro has a 1047 and the M1 Pro has 638, which is a 64% increase. Still not really a slouch. That's a pretty big jump in terms of performance. But remember, I went from the base trim M1 Pro to the top trim M3 Pro. And that should be expected performance gains. If performance is your main issue with your M1 Pro, meaning your workflow has changed significantly and the M1 Pro can no longer do it for you, your best bet would probably be to just go with the M3 Max. If you really need more performance, Go with the M3 Max, or you know, you could go with an M2 Ultra. You could probably find a better deal on an M2 Max right now if you need more performance, which is very rare because I think the M1 Pro suits probably 90% of users. You should probably just spring for the M3 Max if you want more performance, if that's what your objective is. Uh, the M3 Pro is not really made to upgrade for performance from the M1 Pro. That's not really any hate on the M3 Pro. Meaning if you got the M3 Pro, don't feel disappointed. You still have a very performant device. It's just more of kudos to the M1 Pro, which was game changing for Apple. And honestly, it had to be, right? If Apple would have made the M1 Pro incrementally better than Intel, you would still be kind of like, eh, you know, whatever. I don't really need to make a leap. But Apple needs you to make that leap. Apple needs people on their M series of chips. Thus, they have proliferated them amongst all of their devices, their tablets, their iPhones, 
and their MacBooks, laptops, and they've done it on their desktop now, right? So the more people they have on that platform, the more reason there is for developers to build on M series of chips. So the M1 Pro was made to make an impact, right? And I think people kind of have this expectation that Apple is gonna keep doing that but I don't think they're going to be able to stair-step themselves in that way in terms of performance. And uh, it's kind of unreasonable to expect that, especially when performance is already so good on these chips. But needless to say, performance isn't a reason to upgrade. And if you need more performance, you should just go with the M3 Max, right? If you wanted the most performance you can get in a laptop. So you ask yourself, why did I upgrade? While I do enjoy the slight bump in CPU and GPU performance, I wanted a larger screen. Before my M1 Pro 14 inch, I used a Dell XPS 17 which had a beautiful 17 inch 4K screen. It was touch screen, not that I enjoy touching the screen, it just gets fingerprints everywhere. I've never been a big fan of that, nor could it really help my usability uh, in a day-to-day -day life. But the larger screen I noticed actually made a huge difference for me in terms of multitasking. So when I came down to the 14 inch form factor, I noticed split screening was less effective. There was never a world where I'm ever gonna use a quadrant split, which I use magnet fairly often, especially whenever I plug in my MacBook to my dock for my desktop and I'm on a 4K LG OLED display. And I got along with the Dell XPS 17 for a pretty good while. The form factor, it was a large laptop, yes, and it was heavy, but not crazy heavy. And honestly, it was never really that cumbersome for me. I definitely noticed it when I went to the 14 inch form factor, how much lighter the laptop was. But ultimately, I've, I felt like my workflow suffered because I was on a smaller screen. I always felt cramped. And I guess I was spoiled by the XPS 17. So I think the 16 inch form factor, which so far has absolutely changed the game for me. I can actually split screen and do multiple tasks at once and feel comfortable doing that. I can even get away with a little bit of quadrant splitting on this where I'm putting something in the top right corner, like a YouTube video. I'm finding that I'm much more productive on this machine. And I think that's really the objective here is to get work done. Now, in terms of ports, You'd think because I'm getting a larger laptop, I might get a few more ports. That's not the case. Of course, the M1 Pro had a pretty good array of ports initially. I think it's actually a perfect balance because, you know, you can charge on either side because you have USB-C, Thunderbolt, whatever it is. Uh, you have a full HDMI and you also have an SD card slot, which gives you pretty much the flexibility that you would need out of a professional machine, with the exception of the M1 Pro missing HDMI 2.1 which was not very smart. And now as a non-issue, I do have a video on my channel. It's the first video I had where I actually go over how to solve that problem. Basically, if you want to plug your M1 Pro into a 4K display that has HDMI 2.1, in other words, you want 4K 120 Hertz, I'll link that video in the description. And if that's a problem that you suffer from, suffer, I guess would be relative. Like I said in the video, it's first world problems, but it could solve your problem and kind of prolong your life if you're M1 Pro. Now you ask yourself, well, why didn't you just keep the XPS 17? It was good for your work flow. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you had the screen real estate that you needed. It was beautiful. It was 4K, right? Well, that's easy because it would just destroy a battery, right? It was a 4K screen that was bright, vivid, and beautiful, but it also drained the battery fairly quickly. I mean, honestly, that device needed to be pretty much plugged in. At that point, it's almost like those gaming laptops that pretty much are desktops. Uh, they just have screens attached to them. And not only did the 4K screen drain the battery, it also had an RTX 2060 in it which means I could actually be plugged into the wall and it would still drain battery. So battery was the main issue. And honestly, when I switched to the M series of chips, game changer, right? The battery life was just worlds better. Everything else was so far behind at the time. And honestly, I still think Apple kind of is the king of battery life on laptops. So with that being said, my M1 Pro didn't have an issue with battery life, but I did notice that uh, it was starting to wear down at the end of the day. And I would actually kind of question if I'm going to make it through a day. And I was really reminded of how the battery life was starting to dwindle when my work actually got me an M2 MacBook, which granted it wasn't as powerful. The screen kind of bothered me because the refresh rate wasn't 120 hertz. It wasn't ProMotion. But uh, that laptop would last a very long time. I mean, that was that it was insane to me how long that laptop would last. You know, I didn't have any worries. And I was like, wow, is my M1 Pro, is it really that big of a battery hog? And I guess I was spoiled because it's still lasting pretty much all day just not to the extent that the M2 would last. And that could have something to do with the ProMotion display. Um, and of course it'd be an older architecture, but now we go into my 16 inch M3 Pro, which has a larger battery on a three nanometer process. And it has more efficiency cores, which tells me that it should probably be more efficient. Now you can't tell until these reviews come out and people give you their real world usage. But when I watched the event and when I looked through all the, the specs of the laptops, I was like, you know what? Maybe I won't get the crazy jump in performance from M2 Pro or M2, 
but I think because it's three nanometer and we're getting more efficiency cores than I have on my M1 Pro, I should see better battery life. Plus I'm getting a larger physical battery and a larger physical dimension, which means cooling would be better. It's just a win, 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 win. My assumption is that the battery life on this thing was going to be pretty crazy. And so far it is. I don't really have to worry about battery life. Honestly, I've had this laptop and I've been kind of using it for a week on and off doing things, you know, working. I've charged it twice. I really don't see myself frequently having to charge this thing. I feel pretty comfortable. Like I could take it to Starbucks. If it's fully charged, I'm going to be there all day if I wanted to be and come home and still have plenty of battery life to keep going if I need to. So then you say, well, if you wanted more battery life and you had an M2 chip and you saw how good that battery was and you just wanted a larger screen, then why didn't you just get the M2 Pro or whatever, the M2 16 inch MacBook? It's on sale to probably save you money. And uh, I would say, yeah, you're probably right. Probably should have done that. I just have one really shallow reason that I can summarize in two words, space black. The finish on the space black isn't quite as black as the razor blade laptops would be, but I have noticed they do get less fingerprints and they said that that's a thing. And I honestly was like, that's just a bunch of mumbo jumbo. How can you prevent fingerprints? And I think part of that's just how the finish reflects fingerprints and, and how it can collect oils. I do know that my midnight M2 MacBook can get pretty gross, but I have noticed this laptop over the past week and I, yeah, it's getting fingerprints. They don't stay around very long and I can actually wipe them off pretty easy. There were times where I felt like there was just an impossible fingerprint that I couldn't get off of the midnight edition MacBook, or I'm just moving a fingerprint around with the laptop, which is like also equally frustrating. But I think if you get this finish thinking it's not going to collect fingerprints, you're going to be disappointed because I don't think there's anything they can do other than just you not touching the laptop to prevent fingerprints. Of course, the keys are still going to get grease and fingerprints on them and Doritos, especially if you're doing your gaming. Uh, they're definitely not Dorito proof, but I do think it's a good idea for Apple to have this color, probably for the long run. Earlier I said, if you need more performance from your M1 Pro, it's not the M3 Pro that's going to do that for you. Really, if the M1 Pro just works for you right now, it's probably because that chip was just insane. It's just a really good laptop. And if you have an M2 Pro, definitely don't upgrade it to the M3 Pro uh, unless you just want space black. Or if you're like me, you're moving to a, you know, a larger form factor or something. And you, there has to be other reasons because performance just is not going to be it. So really, if I just wasn't seeking more battery life, a larger footprint, and I just really didn't like the color, I think the M2 Pro would have been perfectly adequate given that it's actually a pretty strong chip when you look at it on benchmarks and compare it to the M M2 Max. And if you don't really care about the space black, you could probably get a really good deal on an M2 Pro 16 inch. If, if everything that I had is something that you wanted here, like you wanted a larger screen, you wanted more battery life. I think you could probably get all that if you just got a refurbished or secondhand M2 machine, right? So really the space black was the most shallow thing, but it, it was that little advantage that the M3 Pros had that the M2s didn't. And Apple's good about doing that. It's Apple's like, Hey, people want this make sure they pay a lot for it. But overall, with the M3, I've been pretty happy. Of course, I've got the battery life. I can see the performance here. I do hope that we get more games on Mac, which I think is going to be a thing because that chip and architecture is now scattered across an entire product stack. I think it makes more sense for development to start porting over video games. And there already are some good video games on Mac, but hopefully we see more and more video games start to come to Mac and leverage that GPU performance that you can get out of these machines and I'm actually excited to see what the M3 Ultra looks like and really my biggest suggestion to you is that if you really wanted to upgrade and make the most out of your upgrade I'd say the M3 Max is probably where you want to be and if that machine's too expensive just wait till next year anyways that's just my opinions if you guys think I'm an idiot if you guys just want to air me out in the comments and say you shouldn't upgrade to M1 Pro it's not really made for you I pretty much agree with you so like comment subscribe are you still on the M1 Pro do you plan on upgrading anytime soon I know I didn't, and I definitely don't plan on upgrading this machine for a very long time. We've got more videos coming down the pike. Uh, I've got a few more videos on the M3. I've got a video that I'm working on right now where I've actually trained my car to drive itself using AI. I know that sounds kind of crazy. It sounds like the future, but it is. And if you guys want to see that, let me know down in the comments. Anyways, Marty, I guess, is gone. So me and Marty will see you in the next one. Bye.